Aflac is pleased to provide support for this program and supplemental health insurance for $20 million. Aflac, insuring over 40 million people worldwide. This program is also made possible by Enzymatic Therapy, a natural medicines company. Makers of Cell Forte with IP6, a product for your body's natural cellular defenses. And by General Re, a global provider of reinsurance and capital management solutions to help clients manage their assets, liabilities, risks, and returns. You don't feel like you're yourself anymore. You feel like you're somebody else. We know what is appropriate treatment, and we know that there are significant numbers of patients who still don't get it. In the 1970s and 1980s, there was a great increase in the use of chemotherapy for the treatment of breast cancer. But at the same time, there was virtually no change in the survival rate. Psychoneuroimmunology is really made up of three words. Psycho, which has to do with mind, thoughts, emotions. Neuro, having to do with the nervous system. And immunology, having to do with the immune system. And it really is the effect of our thoughts and emotions on our body's susceptibility or resistance to disease. If I had one message to give to cancer patients, I would say ask, ask, and ask again. So we talked about faith in your doctor, your treatment, yourself, and your spiritual faith. I think if you leave any one of those out, you're making a big mistake. Hello, I'm Walter Cronkite. Most of us know someone who has been diagnosed with cancer. Many of us know someone who has died from the disease. Almost one-third of all women and one-half of the men in the United States will develop cancer in their lifetime. It's the second leading cause of death in America, claiming the lives of one out of every four people. The program you're about to see is a unique and comprehensive overview of information designed to increase the odds for surviving cancer by providing vital information for cancer patients and their loved ones. In the struggle to survive this disease, having accurate information can be literally a matter of life and death. But acquiring this information is often difficult and time-consuming. The shock and fear of dealing with a life-threatening illness makes it difficult to function, let alone absorb new information. This four-part series is designed to be a practical guide of state-of-the-art knowledge, from the basics of obtaining the best treatment to an exploration of a new frontier of consciousness and healing. In programs one and two, we'll explore the physical interventions for cancer through the eyes of cancer survivors and experts. We'll look at survival rates and how to go about obtaining the appropriate treatment, how to deal with doctors and hospitals and the crisis of cancer, as well as conventional, alternative, and complementary treatments. In part three of this series, we'll look at the exciting new field of health, consciousness, and healing. We'll explore mind-body interventions for cancer, including supplemental therapies like imagery, laughter, meditation, and psychotherapy. Finally, despite advances in treatment and many success stories, the tragic fact is that half of the people who contract cancer die prematurely. In our fourth and final program, we'll discuss the role that our spirituality can play when coping with a potentially terminal illness. And we'll investigate the practical issues of dealing with death and dying. A diagnosis of cancer is the beginning of a long and arduous journey for patients, their families, and their loved ones. Cancer, Increasing Your Odds for Survival is a series dedicated to helping people heal from cancer and suggests a new way of looking at disease and life and death. We sincerely hope that you'll find this program useful for your healing journey. 
Well, Cindy was 34 years old when uh, she discovered a uh, lump in her breast, and we went and had a biopsy done, and it was found to be malignant. Um, uh, she received the standard uh, therapy at that time, and uh, I had a lumpectomy. The uh, tumor was removed, the margins were clean, and um, she received radiation therapy. And we were given the odds that she would survive to be at about 70%. And we naturally assumed that she would be in the success side of that 70%. We really didn't think too much about it, and she went in for follow-up examinations and everything was okay for about a year until she found another lump in the breast and um, went back in and found that that was malignant as well and um, then uh, they did an x-ray and found that the cancer had spread to her bones and now the odds were given as 10 percent survival for five years and Cindy didn't like those odds she really wanted to live and so she chose an alternative treatment program that promised better odds um, and uh, unfortunately that program did not work and we tried uh, one uh, last ditch kind of effort in Toronto uh, with an, a conventional and alternative program that was combined and I think it was too late in the disease process and uh, Cindy died in Toronto on January 23, 1990. After the loss of the woman he loved, David Bodner decided to make a documentary to help others dealing with cancer. I thought wouldn't it be a good idea if there was a kind of a jump start of information that was available for people with cancer and their families to get a lot of information quickly so that they could learn what's out there to help them deal with cancer. Um, so I decided to make this documentary and uh, it's probably a little different than a lot of other documentaries. It's educational it's not meant to be entertainment um, because the goal is really much more serious the goal is to save lives and uh, there's a lot of information that uh, is available besides just information about treatments that can help people do that and um, you know as far as treatments go there's a lot of information now uh, about new treatments that are being developed and uh, most of them are in the experimental stage, but hopefully they're going to have a cure for cancer soon. But in the meantime, people with cancer know that they need to know what's available right now to help them survive cancer. And that's what this program's all about. <laughs> Cancer is a condition in which a normal body cell mutates and multiplies uncontrollably. A normal cell is created with a set of genetic instructions telling it how to multiply, how long to live and when to die. But due to a genetic flaw or exposure to carcinogens, radiation, viruses, or causes unknown, a change in the genetic message may alter those instructions and the cell multiplies out of control. At first, the mutant cells multiply slowly and are vulnerable to attacks of the immune system. Often the process accelerates and the increasing number of cells then typically form a mass of tissue referred to as a tumor. There are two types of tumors, malignant and benign. Benign tumors are harmless and do not invade healthy neighboring tissue. In a malignant tumor, Cancerous cells break off and travel through the bloodstream or the body's lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a filtration system, keeping toxins and other matter from entering the bloodstream. Malignant cancer cells are often trapped in lymph nodes, another part of the immune system where many of the cancer-fighting cells are located. This process in which the cancerous cells travel through the body is called metastasis. When a cancer metastasizes or spreads, cancerous cells can be lodged in a wide variety of organs throughout the body where they can grow into new malignant tumors. As a malignant tumor grows in size, it can obstruct the proper function of the organ it occupies, eventually destroying it. In other words, if a cancer cell stayed put and never spread to other organs of the body, it would be non-fatal, it would be benign. But the way a cancer cell eventually, or cancer eventually kills, it literally uh, takes over uh, vital functions of the body 
by replacing normal tissues. Well, the stages of cancer are really a function of how far the tumor gets from where it began. And an early stage of cancer would be where the tumor is right where it began and hasn't spread anywhere else. An intermediate stage of cancer is where the tumor has spread uh, to usually lymph nodes that are nearby uh, or is just plain larger in the first place. Uh, and then a more advanced stage of cancer is where the cancer has spread to other parts of the body remote from where the cancer began. And all cancers uh, have different grading systems that are variations of that central theme. The prognosis uh, it relates very closely to the stage. And it's not quite linear, but almost, that the earlier the stage, the better prognosis. Stage one cancer, having in general an excellent prognosis, uh, meaning curable and in, in many cases, whereas stage four, having a very poor prognosis. For certain stages, radiation and chemotherapy are powerfully effective and clearly improve the number of, of patients who survive. For other forms of those diseases, usually when the disease is widespread, when it's metastatic, when it can no longer be cured by surgery or radiation and chemotherapy, in those situations, our, our effectiveness is far reduced. And there, some patients benefit in terms of having a longer life, relief of cancer-related symptoms, but sadly, we don't cure enough of those patients. The five most prevalent cancers for men are prostate, lung, colon, bladder, and lymphomas. The five types responsible for the most cancer deaths include the top three common cancers and pancreatic cancer and leukemia. The five most common cancers for women are breast, lung, colon, uterine, and lymphomas. The three most common cancers also are among the top five deadly cancers for women, a list that includes ovarian and pancreatic cancer. People are considered to have recovered from cancer if they are still alive five years after diagnosis. These are called five-year survival rates. Five-year survival rates are sometimes thought of and presented as the percentage of people that are cured of cancer. But this is not always true. One of the problems of reporting cancer and one of the problems with cancer statistics is that they're reported on a five-year basis. Physicians understand what that means. They understand that uh, if an individual is alive, after five years, they are considered to be a cure. If the individual expires one day after the five, five years, they are still considered a cure. Still, it's a point of confusion for patients because when they're told they have a 50% chance of being cured, that simply means they have a 50% chance of living five years. A 90% chance of being cured means that they have a 90% chance of living for five years. Cure um, is defined a little differently for each disease. Uh, for example, a patient with breast cancer who was still alive and well and free of disease at five years may or may not be cured. There's a probability that the patient is, but it's not definitive. On the other hand, a patient with a very aggressive cancer, like a leukemia, who's free of disease, no detectable disease, five years after treatment, uh, that patient, uh, you could be confident in the most, for the most part, that they've been cured. The definition of cure is, is difficult. It, it really depends on a number of things. For example, there's some diseases that are quite indolent, certain forms of chronic leukemia, certain kinds of breast cancer, certain forms of prostate cancer, where uh, even a five-year disease-free interval may not be completely satisfactory because the disease may recur at six or seven or ten years. But for other kinds of, of, of cancers, acute leukemias, lung cancers, many other kinds of cancers, uh, the five-year mark is really a, a crucial one because it's, it's much less likely that that, that cancer will reoccur after a, a disease-free interval of five years. 
for some people, having the information about what the statistics are in relationship to their illness is helpful to them. It helps to motivate them to learn more about what they need to know. It helps them to say, well, I'm not going to be in the category that things don't go well for. I'm going to be in the other category. And those are people that have an understanding of statistics refer to the general population and that they're an individual. Whether or not it's better for a person to know uh, the survival statistics for a cancer uh, depends a lot on the person. Uh, some people uh, want to know everything about their cancer as soon as they know they have it. And other people want to know about as little about their cancer as they possibly can uh, for as long as possible. For other people, knowing statistics um, and survival rates is a very frightening thing. It's overwhelming, and it does just exactly the opposite. It almost makes them believe that that's exactly what's going to happen to them, rather than recognizing that they have some ability to make choices and decisions within that framework. So it can go either way. I mean, and you have to really, the challenge is to understand who you are as an individual and how you might use that information. Five-year survival rates can be obtained in these free publications of the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute. Survival rates for your specific cancer and stage are available from your physician or by calling 1-800-4-CANCER with your exact diagnosis. Choices. It's not the first word that comes to mind when you've been diagnosed with cancer. But once you discover you have cancer, the choices you make could literally save your life. In fact, that is the first choice that you have to make. You must choose life, choose to survive, to become an informed participant, willing to do whatever is necessary to win against cancer. Once that fundamental decision has been made, there are an overwhelming number of choices. Which hospital? Which doctor? Which treatment? To name just a few of them. The fact is, many people are misdiagnosed and even more are not receiving the proper treatment. Simply obtaining the most up-to-date treatment can dramatically increase your odds for survival. But how do you make the right choices? The key is information. Taking the time to become informed is probably the single most important action you can take during this confusing and stressful time. In this portion of the program, we'll give you the necessary information to help you make some of these crucial decisions. Aside from obtaining the treatment best for you, we'll give you tips on dealing with doctors and hospitals and discuss the importance of meeting the needs of both you and your family during the cancer crisis. When people are first diagnosed, I think they, people tell us that they feel like the end of the world has come, that somebody has um, just given them a terrible shock. And I think that's probably because too many people still equate cancer with death. For me, being able to cry, I think maybe saved me. Um, at any time of the day or night, just being able to burst into tears and it's all right, I can cry, I need to cry. A big suggestion for people in how to deal with the shock of a diagnosis is to remember to be gentle with yourself. That this is a crisis that's happening to you, it will pass. You'll get your bearings again. And in that period of time, be easy with yourself. Do the things that help you feel better, that soothe you. And at the same time, if you're having trouble dealing with your emotions, you might be doing things concretely, like gathering around your support systems, gathering information, doing things like that to help you, talking with people. It helps to ground you and to feel a little more settled. I think the most important thing for someone who finds out they have cancer is to try to feel um, what you need for yourself and what's going to help you the most. And don't worry about other people like, oh, well, 
is, is my doctor going to think I'm stupid if I ask this question? And it's like, try to let go of all that. It's like, think about you and what do I need here? And just know that you're doing the best that you can. The first things that I would suggest people to do that just found out that they had cancer was to, you know, take care of yourself, regroup with your family, sit down, talk about it, figure out what it is you need to know what kinds of questions you need to know to get the information so that you can proceed with treatment plans so that you can um, hook up with the right medical team for you, people that you feel comfortable with and that takes a little bit of knowing of what you're looking for. Second opinions are very important for cancer patients mainly because you do go through treatment that's very long term. It isn't like having a, a sore throat treated or having your appendix out. So I think you need to make sure for, number one, that the, bi that the uh, pathology has been read so that you know what stage of cancer you have and that the treatment that is being recommended would be the treatment that another physician, qualified physician, would also suggest. The first thing that a person should do when they, they are told they have cancer is to get the best possible opinions about the seriousness of the situation and how it should be treated. Uh, and that includes having the pathology reviewed to be sure that it is cancer and to be sure that you know what kind of cancer it is. And then asking for uh, an expert opinion about how to treat it. And often the diagnosis is made at a community hospital by people who are not very familiar with management of cancer. And so people in that situation need to go to a, a cancer center or, or at least uh, a physician who is an expert in dealing with that particular kind of cancer. I didn't know it at the time I had a tumor in my lung, that, or my right bronchus, my bronchial tube, which blocked off all my air and my lung collapsed. And um, I went into the hospital and um, they only had one chest surgeon. It was a small hospital and um, I had to wait a week for them to do a bronchoscopy. But he did get a tissue sample, and they sent it off to the lab, and it came back benign. Cancer survivor Kelly Mushorn didn't trust the diagnosis and sought a second opinion. What's going on? And then my doctor came in. My parents were in the room. And my doctor closed the door, and I knew at that moment. Second opinions are crucial. Of those seeking second opinions at one cancer center, 70% made changes in their treatment. There are several ways you can find um, a second opinion. You can ask the first doctor if he, has a, he or she has a suggestion. You can call the Cancer Information Service and they can give you information. Um, sometimes the American Cancer Society can help you. So there are several ways that you can go about getting a second opinion. Some institutions provide multidisciplinary second opinions. This is where a patient can specifically request that their diagnosis and treatment is reviewed by a team of cancer specialists. Institutions that provide multidisciplinary second opinions are listed in these books by Richard Block and in the resource guide for this documentary. Once you've had the second opinion, if it agrees with the, the first physician, you can decide whether you want to stay at the major center, whether you want to go back to your local doctor, and that's a personal decision that the people have to make for themselves. If the second opinion is the same as the first one, and if you, the hospital you're at has good facilities, then there's reason to go back to your local physician to be treated. In some instances, it's hard to define what is appropriate treatment. But in other instances, for example, in management of certain forms of early breast cancer, we know what is appropriate treatment and we know that there are significant numbers of patients who still don't get it. Um, the reasons are that practice of medicine changes slowly, that uh, surgeons who are used to doing mastectomies don't like to do lumpectomies. Radiation therapy, which is an alternative to uh, radical surgery for breast cancer, may not be available in all communities. Uh, there are a number of reasons. It takes time to change patterns of practice and to re-educate physicians. Um, there are also probably some economic incentives for maintaining uh, certain practices which are outmoded. Um, people don't like to give up patients. They don't like to refer patients to, to cancer centers because it's a loss of the, the, the patient uh, for their own practice. 
For some people, it's very difficult to get appropriate treatment because of the way medicine is practiced. Um, it takes a long time from the newest therapies to get from the major centers in this country out into the general community. We know that is true in cancer. For example, we know that the children who come to the major centers to be treated, we have a, in some of the childhood cancers, we have an 86 percent uh, cure rate. Yet we know overall in the United States for that kind of childhood can cancer, the overall cure rate is probably down to 60 percent. So we know that it takes somewhere between 5 to 15 years for the newest therapies to become standard practice in the communities. Now for a cancer patient, that is a real dilemma. How do you know where and when you are getting the correct treatment? I think the single most important thing for a patient who has just found out they have cancer is to be sure they're at the best possible institution for taking care of that, that problem. It could be a private practitioner, it could be a, a cancer center or a local hospital, but one has to be sure that that hospital or that, that practitioner can offer the very best. How do you tell that? Well, cancer centers are the, the, the best guarantee, but uh, also you can tell by the, the degrees, the, 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 the fact that your, your doctor is a specialist in this area that has a lot of experience in dealing with it. Uh, and you, you have to d d trust your sense of confidence in that doctor and whether they're, they're able to tell you exactly what's going on and you, you trust what they say. There are some places in this country that specialize in one kind of cancer versus another kind of cancer. There are also some hospitals that, are, that treat only cancer, and there are two or three of those in the United States. You need to ask a lot of questions. You need to find out from your doctor how often he performs a specific operation. When you have one of the more common kinds of cancers, you will find that out in the community, more of the community doctors are can tell you that they do those operations several times a week, for example. If you have a very unusual kind of cancer, then it's more difficult for you to find the place where they are doing those kinds of operations often, and I would suggest that you really need to be in a major medical center at that point. And if you don't get the right treatment in the beginning, then you have lots of complications later on, hospitalizations, treatments that don't work, uh, a lot of uh, problems with you know, the pain and suffering of having to live with cancer. So it's better to get the, the, the right treatment right up front, even though it may be more expensive and inconvenient and, and uh, also probably more toxic in, in initially. But if, if it cures you, you're much better off. You can find the hospitals nearest you that specialize in cancer treatment and in treating your specific type of cancer by calling the Cancer Information Service at 1-800-4-CANCER. Another source of state-of-the-art cancer treatment and second opinions are comprehensive cancer centers. The National Cancer Institute is a governmental agency that um, looks over the cancer situation. And it has designated comprehensive cancer centers, which are the centers of excellence in this country. In order to be a comprehensive cancer center, you must do everything from basic research, that means looking at cellular kinds of issues, what makes a cell change, um, through uh, clinical research, which is taking whatever you're learning in the laboratory and, and using it for um, inpatient trials. You're supposed to be giving um, good care to the patients. You're supposed to be giving the most up-to-date uh, kinds of therapies for patients. There are more than 30 comprehensive cancer centers located throughout the United States. Within most of them is a cancer information service. Cancer information service, good afternoon. Yes, you live in Connecticut? The cancer information service is a program of the National Cancer Institute that provides a nationwide telephone service for cancer patients and their families, the public and health care professionals. I help to run a program for the National Cancer Institute which provides uh, public access to uh, up-to-date information about cancer treatment, diagnosis, rehabilitation, and cancer-related services. 
The main uh, functions of the Cancer Information Service are to provide uh, access uh, by toll-free telephone, our 1-800-4-CANCER number, uh, to the public so that they can have their cancer-related questions answered. You can talk about your problem anonymously. Um, and you can get any kind of information beginning from the preventive aspects of, of cancer right through treatment. What kinds of treatments are being done and where are they being done? Where can I get a second opinion? Um, who is the physician in my local area who is doing, who is doing a clinical trial? Um, what kinds of support services are there? Where are there groups, support groups that I can go to? Uh, how do I get a reach to recovery volunteer? Almost any question you can think of uh, can be answered by the Cancer Information Service. One of the very nice things about PDQ is it gives both patients and physicians the information that they need in order to make appropriate decisions. It empowers all people with the types of information they need in order to make the correct treatment decisions. PDQ, or Physician Data Query, is one of the most important resources accessible through the Cancer Information Service. It can help you determine whether or not you are receiving the most up-to-date treatment. PDQ is a computer database containing treatment recommendations from the National Cancer Institute. Treatment recommendations are given in two ways. The health professional file contains state-of-the-art statements written in language directed at doctors and other health care professionals. The patient information file contains similar material but is written for the general public. The definitions that are in the patient file are really meant to give people a, a, a succinct, clear uh, snapshot of, of the staging and the treatment options by stage for, uh, for their type of cancer. And if someone has the patient information statement and they're interested in reading the physician statement, we'll provide that to them. There's no problem with that. We don't withhold anything from people. It's just that we're really concerned about giving people the information that's going to be the most useful to them. PDQ also contains a protocol file listing clinical trials that are accepting patients for experimental cancer treatments. The file can be searched by diagnosis and location. If you, a friend, or the local library have access to the internet, PDQ's treatment recommendations and information on clinical trials can be found on the World Wide Web and also are available by calling the Cancer Information Service at 1-800-4-CANCER. Treatment guidelines also can be obtained by calling the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Fax Service from any fax machine. All PDQ information is available at most medical libraries, although sometimes a fee is charged. Hi, Mrs. Neal. While having accurate information is crucial, how and if that information is used greatly depends on how well you and your doctor communicate. It's been said before that people spend much more time researching their next car than the doctor with whom they're going to have hopefully a long and healing relationship. And the way that that doctor acts, not only the way they practice medicine from a technical aspect, but the way they act toward you, whether they can help you to be hopeful, whether they can help you to maintain a sense of you can fight this. I was very lucky. My doctor in Boston spent a lot of time answering all my questions. I think the most important thing for me or for someone who's going through a surgery like that is to really be informed. So you don't go into fear of um, you know, pain or something that's going to happen. I think knowing what's going to happen takes a lot of that away and that I know made a really big difference for me. Many times one of the biggest problems people have in dealing with their doctors is they don't feel like they get enough time with the doctor when they're sitting down with them and enough time to ask questions and get responses to those questions. So what we suggest is that you make an appointment with the doctor just for that purpose to ask questions if you can do that. Um, also to bring questions with you when you go into the doctor so you're prepared when you go in there and say I want to sit down and go over this with you and do it in their office not in the examining room so that you're sitting fully clothed you know you don't feel vulnerable and exposed in in that sense family members can also be advocates for the cancer patients 
or we suggest um, that people go with them to the doctor's offices, go with them when they are getting treated so that they can ask some of the questions that sometimes patients are, um, don't want to ask difficult questions because they want to have good relationships with the healthcare team. And sometimes a, a family member can do that for them. For example, if the patient doesn't want to ask for a second opinion because they're afraid they're going to hurt the doctor's feelings, and that happens a lot, I think. The family member can say, you know, she really doesn't want to do that, but I want the second opinion for my own peace of mind. First, we should know what kind of cancer we're dealing with. The patient should ask specifically of his physician, what is my diagnosis? Number two, how long does this cancer grow? How fast does it grow? How much time do I have to make a decision? Bringing a copy of the treatment suggested in the PDQ for your cancer can help you be assured that you're receiving state-of-the-art treatment. It's a way of helping the patient to arrive at the right type of treatment and feel comfortable that the best treatment for him or her was chosen at that time. When people go into hospitals, one of the major problems they have in a hospital is that they're dealing with the hospital system and it makes you sort of part of the system rather than an individual. People need to know that they can ask for what they need in the hospital and they can ask in a way that's not obnoxious or overly aggressive so it puts people off. Even in the hospital experience, it's really interesting to me that people sometimes seem to leave their um, sense of responsibility home when they go to the hospital. You know, if somebody gives you a green pill today and the next day they're giving you a pink pill, wouldn't you think that you might ask, why did I get a pink pill instead of a green pill? Uh, there are mistakes that are made. You know, so maybe you might have gotten the medication that belonged to the person in the next bed, and somehow people don't think that they should ask those kinds of questions. So I think that some family members can do that. Patients ought to be doing it themselves. They, it, it, you need to take care of yourself. Something real important, too, when you go into a hospital is to make your hospital room your own space. Bring in pillows from home, bring in blankets, bring in posters for the walls, bring in pictures of people that you care about, bring in your tape recorders and the music that you like. Make it a space that's homey and comfortable for you so that, you know, you feel like you're, you remember yourself as a living, alive, you know, human being who's expressing health even while you're in the hospital. Be aware that not everybody is going to respond with compassion. Even though they may be capable of it on some level, they're feeling the fear maybe as much or sometimes more than you are. And for them to cope with it can be a difficult thing. They may have their own kind of denial. One of the most difficult problems that I face is not feeling like I used to feel. I can't really put it into words, but I guess another person that's been through this would understand what I'm about to say. You don't feel like you're yourself anymore. You feel like you're somebody else. You, you, you know you're yourself, but you feel like you're somebody else. There's, I always was happy-go-lucky. I'd get up and just go on with my day and never really let even everyday stresses or problems like that bother me. Now I see where um, I have to fight to keep up. I think the most important things a person needs to do when they're confronted with cancer is, is gather your people around you who are going to support you. You see right away the people that are going to take care of you and the people who aren't going to. And don't feel that you have to be with these people who, who it just doesn't feel right to be with them. I know that I lost some friends yeah. yes. because I had cancer, but I gained friends. So what we say is try to make other parts of your life as normal as you possibly can. You know, if you used to like to go to the movies or plays or something, try to see whether or not you can make that a normal part of your life. Try to find some, a few things here and there that make you feel good about it what's happening. Take a little time off once in a while and go do something that's fun instead of making a living out of being a cancer patient. Well I think uh, maintaining uh, a good lifestyle with a lot of exercise, a uh, balanced diet is important, um, putting some enjoyment in your life so that you're not obsessing about the diagnosis and the treatment. 
all those things are important in, in a patient getting through the, the experience of having cancer and dealing with it. Uh, it's like any other crisis in a person's life. It's, it's really not that much different, I think, than marital crises or crises or crisis with your children or other things. You know, the more support you have and the more wholesome you are as a person going into it, the better you're going to deal with it. We try to tell people that they should be honest, that they should think about their own feelings, um, that they should do some normal things themselves as family members. I think you also get really caught up in trying to be the perfect person taking care of the cancer patient and forgetting that you need to have some life of your own. It's getting clear that it's very important that we have support, we have a place to express ourselves, to get information, to feel supported. And therapy, whether it's individual therapy or support groups, is, um, is something I, I believe is a great adjunct to whatever treatment you're going through for your family as well. I think also family members ought to understand that there are some support systems out there for them. There are support groups that they can join. There are social workers at the hospital who they can see. And I think a lot of times people don't understand that the role of the social worker, that the social worker is there to talk to people, to help them think through their problems, to help in some of those communications issues. They're a very important part of the team of people who are taking care of cancer patients. And I would suggest that if you go to the hospital where the cancer patient is being treated and ask for a consult with the social worker, that it would help a lot of family members to sort through some of those issues. All the roles in the family tend to change. Here was the case of a very strong man who suddenly needed to be taken care of. Joan Bursenko is a therapist and co-founder of Harvard's Mind Body Clinic. It's confusing for the entire family system. How does a person maintain their dignity? How does a person who perhaps has never learned how to ask for help learn how to ask for help and to see that this is a wonderful occasion for the giving and receiving of love? It's not an occasion for the loss of dignity. And sometimes just something like that, something that shakes up a family system, can turn out to be just what we need for that family system to heal and to reach a greater level of uh, interaction, a greater level of kindness, a greater level of people helping one another to reach their fullest potential. And that's what I often suggest for people, at least to go in and have a few sessions of counseling where the whole family can participate in adjusting to this new challenge. We do think that it's very important for patients to have strong support from family, from support groups of other patients, uh, to have a positive attitude. Uh, the cancer patient has to go through a lot. There's a lot of mental anguish associated with knowing that diagnosis and taking the treatment. And uh, a positive attitude is very important. It's, it's easy for patients to give up and to become very discouraged. I would also suggest that people begin to be aware of what their peripheral support groups are in the community. Um, begin to contact people that you know who may have information that's helpful to you. Who do you know in the medical community? Who can help you gather information and steer you in the right direction for you? Um, look, call your American Cancer Society, ask your doctor for information about support groups so that you can start joining in with other people who are dealing with similar problems. You attach to the people and you know that they know just what you're going through. It doesn't have to be the same kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be cancer. It's just a sickness, something debilitating, something scary like that. Being there and having people that, that connect with you, that really understand, is, is real important. It's, it's been a savior for me. You know, I, I don't know that I would have ever stopped crying if I, if I didn't find the right group. This is research data of Dr. David Spiegel at Stanford. He had over 50 women with metastatic breast cancer, and he split them into two groups. One got normal medical care, 
and the other belonged to a once a week support group for a year. The women in the support group lived twice as long as the women who got just medical care and no support group and at the end of 10 years, even though they'd begun with metastatic cancer, three of those women are still alive. So I think it's important. And what those women would tell you, it's not just for the quantity of life that support is important. It's because that's the very fabric of life. When we learn to let our hair down, when we're willing to let other people into our hearts, when we can learn to give and to receive love, to be with other people in crisis and to find our best in that situation, perhaps that's what healing is really about. When I decided to start groups to help people live, I sent out a hundred letters to patients who were known to our office, all of whom had cancer. I mean, I had a lot of patients because I had other physicians that worked with me, partners. And um, I thought, when I mailed the letters, I'm in big trouble because I forgot to put, this is only for our office patients. Because I thought, oh boy, they'll get the letter and they'll call their neighbors. And the first meeting, what am I going to do with 500 people? You know, where am I going to put them? And I was a wreck. And then about a dozen people answered. And I thought, at that moment, I have no idea of the lives of the people I'm taking care of, that I don't know them. That you get a letter from your doctor saying, let me help you live a longer, better life, and you don't show up. Dr. Bernie Siegel started the Exceptional Cancer Patients Program that served cancer patients and their families for 20 years. Part of what I realized was I scared them. Why? Because it said you'll read a book, you'll talk at a meeting, you might draw a picture, and that many of these people said, I'm not going to talk about how I feel or read books or draw pictures. I want a pill. If you can't give me a pill, don't bother me. It is an outstanding example of cancer patient support and counseling services. I put five questions in the book. We have over 25 now that we're asking people just to make them think. But the first one was, do you want to live to be 100? Which had to do with one's attitude towards life and survival. Um, that a lot of people with a gut reaction know because they're afraid. And I was looking for the people who are willing to take on life. Yeah, 100, fine. I mean, if you have something to contribute or look forward to, you don't mind 100 or 300. I mean, it's, the number itself doesn't mean anything. The approach that we use here at Exceptional Cancer Patients is based on a lot of the work of Larry LaShawn and Carl and Stephanie Simonton and obviously Bernie Siegel who founded this organization and it has to do with supporting people in, in the parts of their lives that they feel joy and enthusiasm. It's about healing your life, not just healing this illness that's going on in your body. They all had stories to tell you, which were basically, when I learned I was going to die, I went home and started living. I decided to make every day precious, and I didn't die. But the, it was an accident, if you know what I mean. They didn't do it to not die. I have a wonderful letter now that I read that says, I was very sick. They told me I had two months to live, and she, the lady said, this time I was really in bad shape. She, and I thought, the doctor's probably right. So she said, I made out a will. I gave values, treasures to family and friends. I bought a dog, took vitamins, laughed more, and put in a backyard wildlife habitat my life's desire. She said, I thought if I'm going to die, I might as well die doing the things I love to do. And the letter ends, I've been, you know, living as if I'm going to die for years now, and I'm killing myself. Help, where do I go from here? And I told her to take a nap. Um, because that's the kind of thing I want people to do, is what I call burn up. You know, live your life fully. It's like I can't. And this is a lot of times when people come here, they want to know, am I exceptional? What do I have to do? And they put a lot of pressure on themselves to, because they have in their minds what exceptional means. And to them, exceptional means that they have a wonderful, positive attitude 24 hours a day. And we need to do a lot of re-education with people to help them to realize that what we're talking about here is that acknowledgement of all of your feelings is what's important to really allow yourself to experience and express all of your feelings that the sadness, the fear, the anger, the rage, the hurt, the vulnerabilities, as well as, you know, that life is still going on, that you can also have happy times and feel joyful and excited and enthusiastic about your life. I, it's very, very important to me to be in therapy because I need a place and someone to talk to about all the feelings that I have about this and about other things in my life. And I need someone um, to talk with me objectively about that and it, it just I know the 
the effects that it has on my life are very important and I I feel better because of it. I like myself more because of it. When people come in here, we help them to focus on the things that are going right. They always think that we're going to want to find out what's going wrong, you know, like, and we're going to point out, you know, all the things that are not working, which sometimes is what traditional psychotherapy wants to do. It's like, let's get at the problems. Well, we get at the problems, but we do it in a different way. We get at it by supporting what's working, and the problems seem to come up, and they're easier to release. I'm glad that I've been able to confront all the things that have happened to me in my life, and um, I feel like the more I go, the more I clear out what's been, what ha has happened to me, the freer I feel. Almost everybody who comes through here feels that the, there's been a big change in the quality of their lives and that that enhances what's going on physically in their body. It may, it may not change the course of their illness, but it certainly helps them in dealing with the health care team, helps them in accepting or denying themselves of treatment. It helps them in all areas of their lives to feel better about themselves as people, helps the relationships in their families. It helps them to, en to enhance the treatment that they're getting, too. And for some people, they live way beyond the, you know, the, the prognosis they might have been given in the beginning. The quality of support groups and doctors can vary widely. Take the time and make the effort to find one you feel comfortable with and who shares your treatment approach. Living in denial about your cancer is generally not recommended. Use statistics to help you and your treatment team be objective about treatment choices. If the five-year survival rate for your cancer is low, remember that as an individual you can be on either side of a survival statistic. And you can use this information to motivate yourself to learn about what you can do to increase the effectiveness of your treatment and to increase your body's ability to fight cancer. If conventional treatment is promising for your cancer, we caution you not to be lulled into a false sense of security. The cancer may or may not return. The fact that it has occurred is your body's warning that something is not right. Take this as an opportunity to learn what you can do to keep cancer from recurring. Most of all, Share your thoughts and feelings with your family and friends. This is too big a crisis to go through alone. Let others give you the help you deserve. Please join us next time for a look at conventional, alternative, and supplemental treatments that may further increase your odds for surviving cancer. For more information, www.cancersurvival.com.
Aflac is pleased to provide support for this program and supplemental health insurance for 21 million sons. Aflac, insuring over 40 million people worldwide. This program is also made possible by Enzymatic Therapy, a natural medicines company, makers of Cell Forte with IP6, a product for your body's natural cellular defenses. And by General Re a global provider of reinsurance and capital management solutions to help clients manage their assets, liabilities, risks, and returns. The four-part VHS of cancer, increasing your odds for survival, is available for $69.95 and $6.95 shipping and handling. The companion guide is available for $15.95 and $3.95 shipping and handling. Call 1-800-443-2156 or Mail your check to CPTV Offer, P.O. Box 82, Hopkinton, Massachusetts, 01748.